inclusion around the edges. Like uh, Steffi already said, my name is Bernie. I'm an experienced designer for ThoughtWorks in Stuttgart. And I'm also a member uh, of the diversity, equity and inclusion working group at ThoughtWorks. And the Beyond, uh, the Beyond the Status Quo series was created last year in October by my fabulous colleagues, Susanne and Steffi. They are not just like the technical aides around here. They also founded this uh, series here. And this is the eighth iteration. And if you want to find out more about the series, about some of the previous events, uh, you can find all this information on our website. We will post the link later to the chat so you can follow up on previous stuff and uh, amazing talks we did. Before we start with uh, the topic, I want to give a quick introduction to ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks is a leading global technology consultancy that integrates strategy, design, and software engineering to enable enterprises and technology disruptors across the globe to thrive as modern digital businesses. Since its founding, ThoughtWorks has rejected discrimination and inequality and has advocated for uh, diversity and inclusion in the global technology space. ThoughtWorks aims to include all of society in its community through its technology and recognizes that further efforts are necessary to specifically include people living with disabilities. In December 2020, ThoughtWorks joined the Valuable 500 initiative to strengthen its commitment to drive a positive agenda forward, aimed at inclusivity for employees clients and users of our technology living with disabilities. And so today uh, we want to talk with you about accessibility and inclusion. And by me, uh, we, I mean, uh, especially my dear colleagues, Matthew Johnson and Scott Davis, who are here with us tonight. Uh, Matthew Johnson is a technical delivery lead at ThoughtWorks. He has spent his career in the tech industry in various roles. And as a disability champion, he sees inclusive technology as essential to drive, uh, help drive a socially, socially and economically just world. Matthew is a trustee of Stage Text, a UK charity that provides captioning and live subtitling services uh, to cultural events and venues. And he's also a trustee of Scope, uh, a disability equality charity in the UK, helping uh, and he helps them to collaborate with tech companies to make the digital world more inclusive. Matthew also was born deaf. Scott Davis is a principal engineer with ThoughtWorks. He focuses on leading edge emerging and non-traditional aspects of web development like serverless web apps, mobile web apps, HTML5 based smart TV apps, conversational UIs like Siri and Alexa, and on building IoT solution using web technologies. Scott's focus on innovative web development has led him to uh, his accessibility advocacy work, which includes educating developers on accessibility, web design, and uh, on accessible web design, and speaking about the importance of web accessibility for, people's, uh, for people with disabilities. Scott also is a man of many books, articles, videos, and talks, and a true advocate for developers. But now let's start this casual conversation about why inclusivity is so important and how accessibility features already might be an essential part of your daily life. And if you have questions, just ping them in the chat. And now welcome to the virtual stage, Matthew and Scott. Good Navind, how are you? My name is Scott Davis. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction, Bernie, I appreciate it. Um, I'm based out of Denver, Colorado, and my colleague Matthew is based out of a small town in the UK called London. Um, Matthew, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do here at ThoughtWorks. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to go uh, a little bit back to my education, I think. I think it'd be really helpful. And the re I want to say that it, I went to four different types of education. So the first school I went to was a deaf class in a Hebrew school. So we were able to integrate with our Hebrew pen, and that's great. 
Then I went to a school when I was the only deaf person, and I was there for seven years, and that was hard work. You can imagine. I struggled, and we were talking about four, um, 45 years ago. I'm really busy my age there. <laughs> and um, there, there wasn't much, you know, help around. I had to do it all myself. And it clapped it, a lot of people went over my head. And I struggled, I really did. And then I went to a special school the deaf. It was a really, really good school. And if all the people were deaf, the teachers were hearing, it was a mixture of deaf people. But the difference is that I felt normal. I didn't feel different. So that made me realize that's what included me. So I've always used that to drive me. When people say, what is inclusion? Well, that is my definition of inclusion. But uh, you have a quote from uh, Kat Holm, don't you, Scott? Yes, yes. You know, we, we're here talking about inclusion around the edges. And uh, Kat Holmes uh, uh, wrote a, a fantastic book and is the former head of accessibility at Microsoft, said, if you ask a hundred people what inclusion means, you'll get a hundred different answers. But if you ask that same group what exclusion means, you'll get a single answer. What it feels like to be left out. Exactly. And so Matthew and I wanted to talk to you today. You can see we're not going to have any slides. We just wanted to have a conversation about inclusion around the edges and, and, and really riff on this idea of inclusion and exclusion and how you can not only feel included yourself, but how you can help other people feel included in your workplace, in your home, and other and, and other places as well. So I've got one example of that, Scott. So I don't know many people know, but I have this Google phone called Google Pixel. It's not a promotion, it's not an advert, don't worry. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> but this phone has something that not other phones have. It's called live caption. So anything live streaming, anything audio, it automatically come up with caption and it's real time. And it's very accurate. And it it came it came on the market about 18 months ago. So I would able to listen to the radio due to any of the audio except for the telephone. But they twist on for the telephone over a year ago. Wow. I called my son and I, for the first time, I did call him. And maybe it's, um, I mean, the, the, the nickel grip, the, the nickel video, maybe you want to show his guy, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I We've we've got a video here, and 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 we'll come back after the video. It's a short video, but I think well, the it video, really okay. It's up to you. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's show this video right now, and then we'll come back and talk more about it on on the other side. Well, well let me let me. I... This is not a promotion of me. I I, I do not like watching myself, but it gives <laughs> you an idea how neutral this video is and what it really means. And I'll come back to that. In one moment, here we go. I hesitated for a few seconds. And I realized the enormity of it, what it really meant. I'm 55 years old. And for the first time, I was able to call my son. This is Matthew. He likes to swim in cold water. After a swim, you feel alive. Like really, really cold water. I also swam across the English Channel. But that's another story. Matthew is deaf.
People think if I got a hearing aid on, I could hear everything. And that's not true. I lip read most of the time. I have two boys, and they're both very important part of my life. This is Matthew's youngest son. Hi, I'm Harry. He lives in Hong Kong and plays rugby. I always want to keep in touch with him. Before, I need to communicate with him through Zoom or WhatsApp. I would try and lip read him, but it's really hard because it's not 3D, it's a flat screen. When I got the Google Pizza phone, because the live capture Peter, Harry was the first person I phoned. It was incredible. And we were talking for about half an hour. All of a sudden, he said, Dad, do you realise this is the first time we've talked on the phone? I would speechless for three, four seconds and it realised what it really meant. I'm 55 years old, and for the first time in my life, I was able to call my son. It was wonderful. What, what are you going to do? Mobile phone had been around for a long time, and yet hadn't been really fully accessible till now. That's what included me. You don't feel left out. Everybody feels the same. Okay, I, 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 I really don't like watching myself. But anyway, <laughs> I was going to say, Matthew, we have we have plenty of time. We can watch that twelve or fifteen more times if you'd prefer. <laughs> oh dear me! Anyway, if you caught my last few words, that what included me. You don't feel left out. It's true because. It's already on the phone. I don't have to download an app. I don't have to connect to audio. I just don't have to do anything. I just need to, to tweet it on. So my mother can use it. My grandmother can use it. That is another word, frictionless. And that's a very important part of inclusion. You've got to make sure it's frictionless so that anybody can use it. It's not clumpetum. And it's a game changer. Absolutely it is. And one of the reasons that it's a game changer, in addition to the obvious accommodation that it provides you, is that it's just baked into the hardware. It's just everyday hardware. I think a lot of times people feel that accessible devices whether it's a wheelchair or a white cane or, or a hearing aid, is something specialized, something that other people use, not yourself. And to imagine that you own this device right now, whether it's an Android phone or an iPhone, you own a premier accessibility device. Um, it's, it's, we're really living in an exciting time when accessibility is broken through to the mainstream, but accessibility, especially around the phone, it's incredible to think that Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the phone, both his mother and his wife were deaf. He was very, very active in the deaf community and, and Thomas Alva Edison the inventor of the phonograph record and the movie camera, and of course the electric light bulb, he was deaf himself from the age of 12. So it's amazing to think that, that these devices that are commonplace, that are every day, have sprung out of a place of accessibility. Um, and, and now they're just so commonplace that we don't even recognize them as everything, anything other than everyday devices. So do you remember when the, mo when the mobile phone came out, before the privilege only, people thought, that, I, don't know, I don't know if you heard of it, but called the yuppie in, uh, <laughs> in, in the UK. But now everybody needs it because it's so identical. It's so useful. Even the building needs it so they can talk to each other while they're working. It, 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 you know, one talking, uh, working at the top of the building and so on. And it's exactly the same with caption. Originally, it was developed by, uh, you know, deaf people developed caption. But you know what? 
Everybody do caption now. And you know, 80% of Facebook videos watch it with code caption on it. 80%. Oh dear, that's my dog. <laughs> the closed captions now say rough, rough, bow, wow, rough, rough. <laughs> Maybe maybe you got to the captain. Well, I don't know, but um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and uh, close yeah, captioning. Hey, Justin, I'm on a call. To, uh, <laughs> and so the oh, it lot a lot trip from there. Yes. So close caption. Um, the people watch it on the train. They watch it anywhere, and uh, sometimes. They watch it on the, on the movie or something like that. And so all of a sudden, it becomes a main tree. Yes. It's, um, it's, it's really interesting because historically, when, when we've thought about disabilities, that, that model, that mental model that people used was called the medical model of disability. And this is an old kind of... Uh, uh, outdated model, but the focus was on the individual. If you have poor hearing, we'll give you a hearing aid to, to uh, fix your broken hearing. If you have poor eyesight, we'll give you glasses to fix you as an individual and, and, your, and your poor eyesight. That's an old, outdated way of looking at accessibility. The, the new way of looking at this is the social model of disability, which means that what we have to do is remove the obstacles from the environment. And when we remove disabilities from the environment, rather than removing disabilities from the individual, it benefits everyone. This is called universal design. And I know that when I'm riding the bus to work or the train to work, if I have headphones in listening to a podcast or music, I can look up and there's a digital sign that says what my next stop will be. However, if I'm reading an actual paper book or a newspaper and I'm heads down, the bus driver also announces the stop. So I don't have to look up. I can keep my head down and just hear what the next stop is going to be. So when we get back to that statistic, that very real statistic that 80% of all Facebook videos are watched with closed captioning turned on, that is a brilliant example of universal design right there, isn't it? That means it's not about a disability. This is a feature that we all use. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you know, but um, the email is an accessibility tool. Really? No, not email. Go on, go on. We want to talk about it. I mean, uh, you know the story about it. <laughs> it's amazing. So, because what the email was developed by a deaf person. And yes. It was, you know, a communicated tool. So, um, again, another, another um, tool developed by a group of deaf people is the uh, SMS. So when the phone came out, obviously deaf people couldn't use it, but they thought this is great because you could reach out to other people, with, um, you know, remotely, or, uh, uh, in a mobile way. So they developed this SMS tool, and suddenly everybody uses it. It's amazing. This is what I loved about it. It it is, and and I don't think of email as an accessibility tool. I don't think of myself as having some disability that requires me to use email. Um, but Vint Cerf, the, one of the fathers of the internet and one of the inventors of email, said he specifically created email so he could participate in important technical conversations. He says, because I'm hearing impaired, emails are a tremendously valuable tool because of the precision you get. I can read what's typed as opposed to straining what's he heard to be said. And if we think about it, if it's important, we do write it down. 
<clears throat> this has very little to do with disability and, and very much to do with universal design and, and simply common sense. And I love that SMS is an accessibility tool as well. And I love the story about the typewriter. <coughs> I mean, the typewriter was invented many, many years ago. I think, I think you, 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 you explain it better than I do. I think you should explain it. I think it's, I think, I think it's just wonderful to hear uh, a big love story about the typewriter. Oh, yeah. So in the early 1800s, there was an Italian inventor named Pellegrino Torri. And Pellegrino, now some people say he was having an affair with his blind friend, the Countess Carolina Fantoni di Fasano. But regardless of whether they were romantically involved or not, the story is that he invented the typewriter with its raised text, with its embossed text, so that he and the Countess could continue to share either love letters or love letters as the Countess lost her vision. Wonderful story. I love it. I really love that story. But also, now, uh, go on. Yeah. I was just going to say another version of this history is, is has the inventor of the typewriter as Agostino Fantoni, who was developing it to help his blind sister. But regardless of what, what the actual facts are, we see that Braille, which is now embossed type, which is now raised type that helps the blind read, that came out just a few years later in 1829 by Louis Braille, who is inspired again by these ideas. So thinking of the keyboard as an accessibility device, um, is is uh, quite limiting, um, especially if you think that the keyboard should only be used by blind people writing love letters to Italian inventors in in the 17th century. That's that's quite limiting, wouldn't you say? Quite nice. So every time I type my keyboard, I would think, oh, maybe I should write some love letters, but uh, it's, it's a very <laughs> fun tool. Right. The other thing is about point recognition. So we know yes. Hey Siri was developed by a blind person uh, who worked for Apple. And um, now everybody uses it in home devices. It's everywhere. This point recognition, Hey Siri, you've got the Amazon uh, Google Home devices. It's amazing that if you think about developing for people with disability, it becomes actually a benefit, a, side, a positive side effect for others, for all. So that's why you should think about when you develop your own product or service or process, you should think about accessibility or universal design because eventually you had positive effects. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about smartphones a lot. And the touch screen on the original iPhone was developed by a company called Fingerworks. Woof, woof. The, the yeah. touch screen... <laughs> the touch screen was developed by a company I called... I think somebody got the back door. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I may have to shoot the back door. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Is that the right with everybody? I'm really sorry. It's just fine. I'll tell you the story of Fingerworks while Matthew steps away. Fingerworks was uh, the company that invented the touchscreen, all the gestures that we know on the smartphone. And the founder of that company created this touchscreen interface because he was dealing with severe carpal tunnel syndrome and typing on a keyboard, even love letters, was painful to him and debilitating. So he came up with another way to gesturally interface with this. Apple acquired Fingerworks 
And when the original iPhone was released in 2007, that touch interface that we're also familiar with is, is what was released. Oh, but Matthew, now that you're back, you mentioned Siri and Google. And my love is conversational UIs. This is what I do professionally. So I could talk about conversational UIs for the rest of the time we have together here. But you're right, Siri is a screen reader originally developed for blind people for low vision users that is simply broken through to wild mainstream success. It's amazing to think that every time you say, hey Siri, or hey Google, or hey Alexa, hey Cortana, hey Bixby, hey Viv, how many devices have I triggered from all my listeners right now? But every time you speak out loud and more importantly, when they speak back to you, you are using a screen reader. You are using assistive technology that has been around for decades. The only difference is you don't associate that with a disability. You associate it with an ability. You associate it with innovation. And that is what's so exciting. Accessibility is a springboard for innovation. And once we change our thinking, once we remove tying accessibility features to a disability, and we think of it in terms of innovation, it changes the entire conversation. When Steve Jobs introduced the original Macintosh on stage in 1984, Matthew's dog was barking and now my phone Siri just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking. No, when, I mean, yeah, when Steve Jobs, one, one moment, one moment, Matthew. Sure, when yeah, Steve sure. Jobs introduced the Macintosh on stage in 1984, he had the Mac speak for itself. It said, thanks for taking me out of that bag never trust a computer that you can't lift. That was 1984. And we can draw a straight line from that original Macintosh to the smartphones and tablets and laptops and smart speakers that we all have in our homes today. Accessibility has always been with us, as you've seen, through example after example after example, what maybe is different is now we're aware of their accessible origins and how we're not tying these features to disabilities anymore. These features are simply features that we expect everyone to use, universal design. Yes, so, um, you know, I've got a really good dog because I can't hear the door knocking. So big dog bark, we told me somebody's at the door. However, if I needed those home devices, they could tell me that there's somebody at the door. You know, they could it's a vibrate or they, they caption. When the bed came out, it was only point recognition, which means it was not inclusive. But over time, they added a caption and so on, which is great. So what I'm saying is, when you develop a product, it doesn't have to be fully accessible. You've got to start somewhere. Um, it'd be good to start at the beginning. It could be cheaper in the long run. You don't have to have alpha thought because any alpha thought could make the product bulky and difficult. So the ease. Oh, please go oh. ahead. No, go on, go on. I was just going to say, uh, and now, now Matthew is a designer, and I'm a I'm a web architect, but we both feel the same way. The earlier we think about these issues, the cheaper they are to implement, and you quite literally get them for free if you build them in intentionally from the onset. Um, when uh, uh, you have your phone in vibrate mode and you don't have deafness or a hearing loss, 
you're using a feature. I have my phone flash whenever a message comes in or whenever a call is coming in um, because I'm often on calls all day and we don't want these devices to interrupt us. But by appealing to a different sense, my sense of feel, the kinesthetic experience of holding that phone or my sense of sight catching those. And that is what I think is crucial, both from a design perspective and from a software architecture perspective, is if you simply plus one your senses, if you simply think about two senses instead of one sense, every time you're thinking about a feature, that's accessibility. How do your images sound? which means how does your alt text sound? There's a brilliant website called Alt Text is Poetry. Yes. Alt Text is Poetry. Because what you're trying to do is not describe every essence of that photo. You, what you want to do is you want to give people enough through words that they can appreciate the photo. We talked about closed captioning with, with uh, these videos. We wouldn't attend a, a, a video conference like this if there was no audio. We would say it's broken. Similarly, we should not attend conferences like this that don't have closed captioning. Because without closed captioning, after the fact when we record it, we can't search for these videos. We can't search for videos without text, without transcripts. We don't have good SEO, search engine optimization, without captions on our videos. So if you simply think of two senses every time you're deploying a feature, that is gonna get you so far down the accessibility road. And notice we haven't talked about disabilities here. We're talking about features. We're talking about using accessibility as a springboard for innovation. And it's not that, absolutely. And if we are, everybody, everybody, including all the audience, will be disabled if they're lucky enough. If they live long enough, we will all have a disability. So what you'll do when you develop a product, you actually do it for yourself as well, for your family, for your friends, everybody. So I think if I've got a quote, it's something like 80% of people in their working life become disabled. Now, when we talk about disability, it doesn't have to be permanent. There are three different types of disability. One is permanent. So for example, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm deaf deep birth. Or it could be temporary. You may have a broken arm or a broken hand. And if you have a broken hand, you can't use the mouse. Or you may have to try and do it on your other hand. Or you may not able to do the keyboard work and so on. And there's another word it's called situational. You maybe carry a child or a small child, or a luggage, or a picture. But you are hindered by this type at that situation. So there are three different types of disability, permanent, temporary, and situational. So, so this is important to remember. It's not just for a few, but for many. Yes. And situational disabilities are, are, are what's interesting. I wouldn't consider myself riding the bus with headphones in being a temporary or situational disability, but in fact it is, I can't hear. Also, if I'm in a noisy pub watching a rugby match or a cricket match, I don't know, are cricket matches noisy? Do people get noisy while they're watching cricket? <laughs> if I'm in a noisy pub and I can't watch, I can't hear the commentators, they'll very often have closed captioning on. I can hear, but not in that situation. 
So we begin seeing over and over again the applicability of, of these kinds of uh, 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 features. Uh, if I'm holding a baby in my arms, it doesn't feel like a disability, but I do want to say, hey, Alexa, play a lullaby <laughs> in the hopes that this crying baby will go to sleep. So we begin seeing just over and over and over again um, what Apple says. You know, Apple won the Helen Keller Award for uh, enabling technology, for accessible technology. And Apple says, we don't make devices for some of the people or even most of the people. We make devices for all of the people. And so when we start considering a, a whole browser development experience, when we're holding a smartphone in our hands and we insist on only having a visual representation, we might be missing the entire point of holding a smartphone in our hands in the first place, not taking advantage of sound, not taking advantage of the microphone, not taking advantage of the speakers. Um, Apple, um, we'll be releasing a new Apple Watch very soon. And the accessibility features they've released on that are simply mind-blowing. In addition to being able to speak to my watch, I'll be able to do gestures like this to move among options on the screen and this to confirm. So imagine looking at your watch, saying, do you want to reply to Matthew, no or yes? No, yes, yes. Being able, to do... <laughs> Being able to do that feels like science fiction, but it's not. It's on the hardware. It's on the devices that we already own. And that's why I want to come back to this idea of inclusion around the edges. We know what exclusion feels like. We know what it feels like to be excluded. If you were on a call and there was no audio, you wouldn't attend. And so all of these features on these various devices, they're there for you. Imagine being on that bus and if the bus is moving that you can't see the screen, being able to talk to your phone or being able to use voiceover and gestures to navigate, all those are available to you. And so it's up to you to choose the right modality, choose the way that you want to interface with that device through your eyes, through your voice, through your fingers, through gestures. They're all here and they're all waiting for us to take advantage of and begin using. Absolutely. And when you want to develop your devices or your product or whatsoever, you must include end usage. And they have to be real people. You cannot bait on assumption, i.e., okay, does that work for blind people? I'm gonna get a blind, I'm gonna blow blind my uh, blindfold myself. Oh yes, it doesn't work. You really need to get a real person who's actually blind to test your product. You have to. That way, they know all the nickel Could, For example, people say, hey, look, Matthew, these are uh, really good caption. But when I actually live and breathe caption, I know some works well and some don't. And I go, well, so I remember somebody said to me, look, Matthew, I could, we got, I managed to connect my Apple Watch with the caption. How cool is that? I mean, I were talking about a couple of years ago and I looked at it and I thought, no, because I'm not going to be able to understand what you're saying. I can only read about 80%. And I have to, my brain had to project the extra 20% Process to fill the twenty percent the gap, and it, it, it really hard work tiring. So that's important part. And also, so I want we we ought to talk about what we thought we were doing. Yes. So we are 
at the beginning of this journey, we are embracing accessibility. We are embracing inclusivity, I think. I think um, Bernie was talking about the Valuable 500. We are now a member of the Valuable 500, which means that we put the disability in the business agenda, right at the top. Because many companies say we are diversity and inclusive, but they don't include disability. But the value for 500, they have to include disability. And those five or 500, there are a lot of big companies there. Big company, we're talking about, you know, like Coca Cola, Unilever, we can talk about Microsoft, Google, and so on. And thought work, we're very proud to become a member because we truly believe that we need to make an effort and make our product more accessible. So for example, we should rebrand it. We should re done a rebranding. And the one thing I love about, we have tried to make it accessible. We have tried to make all our font accessible. But the best bit, my favorite bit, are the colors. We only have eight different colors. Eight, where before the, the rebranding, we had hundreds. But now we only have one shade of pink, one shade of green, one shade of blue, and so on. We've made my life easier, and they are all accessible, and they're beautiful colors. So that is a really positive side effect when you think about accessibility. And another thing is we created accessibility team, a core team, how we can make our services, how we encourage our people to be, you know, a great accessible. We provided making sure our tool is accessible. We, we are providing training pathway so that they can learn about accessibility. We're not, we're not there by a long shot, but we're on that journey. And we also want to encourage our client to embrace accessibility. Just like the way our way of working, it's the right thing to do. There's a philandering sense and so on. So, is there anything to add there, John? Because uh, we thought work is on that journey. So, it, as an individual person, I'm looking at you in the eye. Are you ready for it? Are you going to embrace accessibility? If you are, great. That, that's the first question. Second question is, how? What are you going to do about it? There's so many things that you can do right now to get started. If you're a web developer and you have a good continuous integration pipeline, a good CI pipeline, one of the things you can do <clears throat> is add a Lighthouse report to your CI pipeline. Lighthouse is a free tool that's baked into every Google Chrome browser, and it pulls up performance reports. It pulls up SEO reports, search engine optimization, and it pulls up accessibility reports. So you can see this in the browser in real time, and then you can NPM install Lighthouse and make it a part of your CI pipeline. This is what we do when we're talking about DevOps. This is one way that you can add that to your pipeline. But I do wanna caution you about one thing. A lot of times when people talk about accessibility on the web, they focus on these accessibility reports. And these audit reports, as powerful as they are, they can only catch at most about 25% of the accessibility errors in your website. What Matthew said earlier, we have to have humans looking at these websites and working with them. There's a great saying in the accessibility community, in the disability community, nothing about us without us. Nothing about us without us.
And so while ThoughtWorks can help you get those audit reports added to your CI pipeline, that covers about 25% of the problem. ThoughtWorks is made up of people, of humans, who can help you solve that other 75% of your problem by bringing common sense to the problem, by bringing experience to the problem. But most importantly, if you are focusing on what your website already does, you're looking back. That's almost a risk avoidance position to take. ThoughtWorks is about pushing the boundaries of technology and accessibility should be a springboard for innovation. And ThoughtWorks can help you adopt that mindset and realize all the things you can do with the smartphone you already have in your hand. So I think that brings to the end our, our, our conversation here. We want to open this up and include you in the conversation now. As you can tell, Matthew and I are not short of opinions and not short not of it. words. So please don't be shy. Please ask us lots of questions because we'd like to hear from you as well. Yeah, we could we could carry on. We could carry on talking because we do have a terrible habit, but we're going to stop yeah. here. And you also like read my mind because there are many comments and questions in the chat already so i will just start uh, from the top and christina wrote that it would be really great to get public schools to have these discussions for the staff and especially for children and students yes it's um it, it's it's about inclusion once again I, I i know historically in the u.s People with disabilities would be shuffled off to other schools or other classrooms within the school. Um, the model now is one of inclusion, saying, please come to all the classes that you can attend, that you can participate in. And if you can't, of course, then we can provide accommodations. But if the default is inclusion, everyone benefits. Then uh, we have another from Waldemar Kindler. I've seen so many people at the train station who were in a hurry and accidentally got at the wrong train. The audible announcement of the destination prevented them from riding with the wrong train. Smiley face. So that's a very know. common problem with me. Now, I should follow the people sometime on, on my own and everybody leaves. And I'm reading a new paper and I look up and I'm on my own in the carriage. I have no idea where they, and then I look at the announcement, nothing happened. And either the train moved and I'm too late to get off, or I get off, but I have no idea where to go. So yes, you know, I, I, it, it, it's, um, I can see that's happening very shortly to in public. It, it, it not just um, railway station, but also airport, uh, you know, venues so on. So I, I don't know what the audience like. I know cricket is probably not a big, big sport in Germany. But cricket it uh, play with a, a bat and a ball, but it's a very big game in um, in England and a very massive game in India. But it's, um, in in at venues um, we um, I managed to persuade Law, which is the home ground cricket in the UK, to put caption on in their matches this summer. It took me three years to get there to persuade them. But now they have it on the big screen, which means that I could watch, uh, well, I could, I, I could read what everybody's saying. And uh, it's great. And also I could follow the protocol if someone's not well, what to do, or we we spa to go to, or they'd uh, they'd um, special offering and you know promotion, or what's the name of the bowler? Because sometimes you can be quite far out, but it's not that. It should be more inclusive. It's wonderful. And what Matthew just talked about there is a great example. For years they've had audio. And all we're asking them to do is plus one their senses. If we have audio and text up on the screen, 
look at, at look at how that opens that up for everyone. If the announcer says someone's name and I miss it, or it's noisy and I can't hear, I can glance up real quick, read their name. It benefits everyone attending that game. And someone walking along in a conflict, we didn't even an enormous conflict. I think he can walk up sideways, up and down. And sometimes you can hear him, and then when you go to the other side, you don't quite hear it work. But it's you have to capture this hop, it, 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 uh, it's quite relaxing. Well, they have to really listen intensively what the speaker is saying. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, then uh, just continue with the next uh, comment. So many great comments. Or maybe like I, uh, I mix it up a little and I switch to like something phrased as a question. Uh, so like there's a question from Katharina and she asks, how can we argue properly for prior uh, prioritizing accessibility when building a product? So many great examples in this talk already, but maybe you also made the experience that clients tend to forget in quotes after a while, as soon as the next deadline hits. So, I mean, uh, that, that, that's the hardest bit. Um, I think, I think it, it, it's important to have a good conversation with the key stakeholders, why we should embrace accessibility. And for we'll start, the, the minimum of 15% of the population are disabled, 15%, that's one billion. But in some country, more. So in the UK, it's about 20%. So if you don't make your product accessible, you actually exclude that market. You've included almost one bit of the population. So there's a financial incentive to make your product accessible. But not only that, when you make your product accessible, you can't make too many things. You've got to keep it simple and clean. So it's cheaper to maintain it. It's cheaper to create a framework and replicate it. So the development is great. Like what I said about the colors, because in order to make it acceptable, we have to choose eight colors only. And all of a sudden, it makes our life so much easier. Um, what's the other one? Oh yeah, and uh, there's a spending power of eight trillion dollars. So every household we had a disability, the spending power of people uh, with a disability in the household, eight trillion dollars per year. So there's not a lot of benefit. Um, the other one is 80% of the consumer will buy your product if it's accessible, because it, it, it's a nice thing to have. It's um, it, a hand your brand. The um, you know it's good for marketing. It's good for investing. Invest a lot of better and much more so uh, social conscious of it. So making your product accessible is a good thing. And also, when you when you think about accessibility, you become very innovative with your product. You start to think outside the box, and you get really good positive side effects from it. And so, the other thing I always have to compensate with the with the client or the stakeholders, and also in this in the, in the, it's a very life cycle in the process. If you ship accessibility to the left, right at the beginning, rather than the end. If you think about accessibility right at the beginning, in the exception, delivery, development, QA, testing, if you keep repeating that, and it's become the norm, like brushing your teeth, it, it, it reduces weight, it reduces time, and it reduces cost because they, otherwise they are for thought. I want to come back to a really important point that Matthew made that one 
in five people worldwide has a disability. One in five people, if you have a disability, any form of disability, it makes you a member of the largest minority in the world, effectively a country the size of India or China. So when we're talking about this from a business perspective, I would hope that empathy would be enough. We don't want to exclude one fifth of your customer base, but if we can put a real dollar amount on that, Matthew said that disabled block, that largest minority in the world is actually the third largest spending block behind the US and China. The disabled community valued at $8 trillion is an enormous market. And you don't realize how many of those folks you are excluding right now with your website. There was a lovely survey done in uh, the UK called the Click Away Pound. The Click Away Pound. And they estimated that 17 billion pounds were left behind in shopping carts because people with disabilities could not complete the transaction. So if we start thinking about this in very hard numbers, 17 billion pounds in lost revenue, a third largest market on the planet worth $8 trillion, we start seeing that this is a very compelling market to pursue from a business perspective. And if we do pursue that market, and it also helps us from an empathetic perspective, from just a basic humanity perspective, oh my goodness, that's a win-win. I couldn't ask for a better scenario than that. Yeah, it's super interesting. Also, like to me, a lot of the arguments uh, pro, um, like focusing also, on inclusion and uh, like disability in a project, a lot of those arguments sound very similar to the arguments for user centricity, like when talking to a client about user centricity. And you also brought up like the term of universal design. So would you say like that there is uh, like some partnership between user centricity and uh, inclusive design and uh, so to go hand in hand oh yes absolutely good point that's a thing so yeah then i go to the next comment and it's coming from nicholas jacob and anytime i ask those companies or university how they actually address disabled people already during the interview process I get no answer or awkward ones. A lot of people seem to think accessibility means only whether you can get there by wheelchair, which is in most cases also not thought through well. It's really annoying. So much talents get lost. Happy to hear ThoughtWix is different. Thank you. You bring up such a good point as well. I, I've worked with developers who kind of look to their left and look to the right and say, well, I don't see anyone with a disability. Maybe, maybe, maybe we don't have any customers with disabilities. And we've already said one in five. If you're in a team of five people, at least one person has a disability. But what's really compelling about that is that three out of four of the disabilities are invisible disabilities. You think that if you glance around and you don't see a wheelchair or a white cane or dark glasses or hearing aids, that there must be no disabilities around, but that doesn't account for autism, anxiety, dyslexia, colorblindness. The list kind of goes on and on about all the different ways that disabilities can affect you in a hidden way. So again, by focusing on the individual and saying, well, I don't see anyone, so no one must have a disability, is the opposite. That's the old medical model, focusing on the individual and trying to fix them, which is just 
deeply broken and disturbing on so many levels. What we should be doing is removing impediments from the environment. That means that, hey, every time I ask Siri a question, she's basically reading a Wikipedia article. She is reading the first sentence of a Wikipedia article. So if Wikipedia ensures that their articles sound as good as they read with their eyes, they've opened that door for Siri and Google and Cortana and Alexa to begin using that website in a way they didn't imagine. And so you can't trust your eyes. You can't. Our job is to remove impediments from the environment that's what real innovation is. Well, then our next comment is from Christina. She writes, I've talked with several older folks who get very frustrated and feel left out of most of the modern technology because things have been made too complicated. Also, many people are forced to adopt modern digital systems when they were perfectly fine with the old ones being forced to do online banking, for example, instead of being able to walk into a bank or phone and speak with a human. After hearing the people speak, I started noticing these problems as well. So. Yes, um, I think that the danger of people working in the tech, when you work in the tech, sometimes you get carried away. You think everybody knows how to do a mobile phone. Everybody know how to use an app. Everybody know how to download an app and so on. And then I think we sometimes get a bit too far ahead. Because sometimes we realize that the public, the general public, are not there yet. But having said that, what one important element of it is friction. I mentioned that earlier of our talk. Friction. This is so important. It's not about making your product accessible. It's also about making it frictionless. So for example, with my phone, in order to have the caption on, I should put it on, frictionless. Keep it simple. So, I, I mean, we, we, we do make it complicated, but this is keep it simple. I mean, it's a very complicated tech. It's taking years, years for, to, for the captain, for the speech tech to become accurate. Years, I think it started something like 1934, if I'm correct. 1934, when we started using uh, point recognition. And now it's only in the last year, it's become really accurate. Two years ago, it wasn't good. I couldn't use it. Now I can use it all the time because of the data machine learning. The key is simplicity, although it's very complicated. The beauty of it is sympathy, friction. Did that, did that help, Christina? I liked it. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say that maybe um, to buck that conventional wisdom that things only get more complicated um, as we modernize, I might argue that in certain instances, we're getting simpler and simpler. We've moved from 101 keys and a mouse to a touchscreen interface where you can literally swipe and pinch. It feels a lot more intuitive to now a conversational UI. It's amazing to think, but 15% of Americans are illiterate, can't type, can't read on a screen at all. So a conversational UI actually brings them to the computing world. When I walk into my kitchen in the morning, I say, hey, Alexa, play me some Bob Marley because I want to listen to music. But imagine if I could say, hey, Alexa, when is my doctor's appointment today? Or, hey, Alexa, can I schedule a doctor's appointment? Or, hey, Alexa, can you read that kidney dialysis report to me? Hey, Alexa, can you explain that kidney dialysis report to me? We see that we are just scratching the surface of what's capable 
through conversational UIs. And it really has the real potential to simplify the way we deal with uh, the, the way we deal with computers. Sometimes people call that ubiquitous computing, and it involves a lot of buzzwords, artificial intelligence and natural language processing and cloud services and all things. But it's ama amazing to think that all of those complex terms actually result in a dramatically simplified user experience. So I feel like if we're doing it right, we're reducing complexity in the user's world. And a very, very obvious way to do that is to remove the computer from the equation altogether and just say, hey, talk to me. What's on your mind, user? And also, the University of Sudan, there's seven principles. One of them is sympathy, consistency. So if something goes wrong, I mean, we 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 expect we like to think everything goes well, but we have to think what happens when things don't go well, when don't think don't go according to plan. So what happens when it go uh, it go uh, you know it doesn't go well or according to plan? What do you do? What sort of method do you play? You've got to be consistent and simple for well, everybody to understand what to do. Because before we sometimes have come up with a, on the web page 404, poor people, my, my grandmother, we have no idea what 404 means. So that's another thing that people forget to come with a really consistent method and explain in simple terms what to do next in a consistent manner. We're coming surely to the end. Um, I think we won't get through all those amazing questions and comments. So they have uh, been wonderful questions and comments. I've enjoyed answering them. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, like, uh, I say sorry in advance if I don't come to your question. Like, uh, we then ran out of time, but I don't want to take too much time. So I just go to the next comment and hear your wonderful answers. And uh, it's a comment by uh, Nicholas Jacob. And I just wanted to make a comment. While I love new technology and chat systems, especially as an autistic person, I'm also very worried about the privacy and probable censorship huge companies might do, like Apple announcing they might screen pictures in the future. As a queer person, in brackets, there's always so much wonderful intersectionality. This worries me a lot. Besides the Apple Watch might be nice. I don't think health insurances help you paying for it. And a lot of disabled people don't have the money to buy such things. I mean, it's a great, it's a great one. Um, this is something that we need to keep uh, talking to uh, the client, encourage them. What is right, what is wrong? I mean, you know, um, talking about the health insurance, I mean, I know some health insurance encourage you to do activity so you get point. And by getting point, you get award or uh, you know, benefit or you know, free free asset, free member, free ticket to the cinema or something. But what happens if some of them cannot do those activities? You're actually excluding them. So that's something I'm I'm not uh, a big fan of. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think it's it's about educating them. Because I think people, it, it's not on purpose that they, they do anything. They're trying to make people to do more activity, to become healthy, live in a healthier lifestyle. But actually, what they hadn't thought about, can everybody exercise? You know, it's a thing that need, people need to think about. So I think education is one thing that we, uh, we need to do. I don't know what about you, Scott. Privacy is, is just such oh, yeah. a, a, an important issue for me. And what I love are some of the advancements in, in both Android and iPhones. Um, the, the next Android uh, phone that comes out, the, the Pixel 6 from Google, 
is going to have an onboard tensor chip. And TensorFlow is what's doing a lot of the artificial intelligence, the machine learning behind handwriting recognition, but most importantly, behind speech recognition. Currently, the way most of these conversational works is you say their wake word, hey, Alexa, and then she wakes up. And then the next thing I say, play me some Bob Marley. She records and sends off to the cloud and it's processed. Well, having an onboard tensor chip, <laughs> there's Artemis in my background, my young kitten. <laughs> um, having this tensor chip on the phone means that Matthew can have these live translations, these conversations with his son in airplane mode. That AI, that processing is happening on the phone. And Apple just announced the new iPhone 13s. And way in there, buried in their new feature list was that Siri now has offline support, which means Apple also has dedicated hardware and dedicated software for dealing with these kinds of things. The machine learning and artificial intelligence, the, what's keeping my, me in focus as I move around is the camera I'm using is doing eye tracking. It knows where my eye is and so it can follow that around. That means that when I turn my iPhone around and take a picture, it can also say two people facing the camera, one person smiling. All that is something that happens today in the phone offline in airplane mode because that machine learning, that artificial intelligence is happening on device. So I agree with you, privacy is a very real concern, but we do end up having hardware and software solutions that help me embrace these new features in a privacy preserving way. I'm not gonna make excuses for companies that don't respect my privacy, but I think it's very important for us to recognize when these privacy affordances um, are available to us. Amazing. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, fantastic questions, comments, for your fantastic answers, for the fantastic presentation, uh, conversation. Uh, it almost like breaks my heart to leave the last two very uh, good comments in the comment section, but yeah, we are out of time. So, uh, I think um, I wish everybody like a very nice evening, uh, day, lunch, wherever you are, like enjoy uh, the rest of your time. And, well, I, uh, I had a great time talking here. And uh, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, yeah. Talk. And I also want to leave like the, the last words to, to both of you, like to uh, maybe as like one giveaway thing, like, if there's one thing people should take away from that conversation, just like one habit to pick up like from now on or like going forward, what would that be for you? One thing. Only one? <laughs> I mean, I think you should say embrace it. How, how do you know about accessibility? What do you need to do about it? That's the question. If you want to embrace accessibility, what do you need to do? And uh, I think that, 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 that's the thing you need to go, go away and how, how you can uh, learn about accessibility, embrace it. What do you need to do? My parting thought for you is this. Accessibility is all around you in probably ways you didn't recognize. Uh, Turn on closed captioning the next time you're in a video conference or you're watching a, a show on TV. Actively seek out these affordances, these accessibility features. Once you have a watch and you can start doing gestures with your watch, it's going to amaze you that those features have been around you for years and you didn't realize they're there. So open your eyes and 
take advantage of, of the magic that's around us right now. There's so many accessibility features waiting for you to discover and waiting for them to add value to your life. So don't, don't miss out on, on these accessibility features that are just waiting for you to use. And you never know, you might develop one something that is acceptable, that has become universal accepted by all. How cool would that be? Exactly. Awesome. Those were like some very good parting uh, sentences for t-shirt prints uh, available soon. <laughs> at, uh, beyond the status quo. Thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, have a great day, night, afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. See you.